Good morning. Welcome to today's worship service. I am your lay leader, Beth Kaiser. Thank you for joining us in our worship service this morning. Members, guests, and to our friends that will be joining us worldwide. We extend the invitation to you when you are in the Chicago area. We'd love to have you join us in person. We are located on the corner of Lockport and Illinois streets in Plainfield, Illinois. We will do everything in our power to make you feel at home, for we have some of the finest people in all the world here at PCC. Please take the time to complete the communication and prayer form. It's in your bulletin. Um, any of you who are viewing this online, you can fill out the prayer request form on our website, which is PlymouthCongregational.org. Forms are collected during our prayer time, and if you don't have enough time to fill it out before then, you can put them in the offering plate as well. Those prayers are lifted up today and during the week through our prayer network. We do have treats in the East Room. I was peeking to see if they were over there. I heard, I heard somebody say we have cake, so there's cake over there. Um, and it has a special message on it? Oh, so it says we're having a new baby coming in June. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> well, guess what? It's not me either, so. And it's not me. Are you sure? Do we, do we need to check? No. Okay. I already did. All right. Um, as far as announcements go, let's change the subject. Whew. Uh, next Sunday is our chili cook-off, so don't forget to bring your chili in. And, you know, it's a big competition here, so get working on your chili. And uh, Thursday, February 15th, is our family, family prayer time at 630 here at the church. Are there any other announcements? Dokey. Uh, please follow along as I read the call to worship. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi 1, verses 11. If you would stand, please, and sing the praise hymn, number 507, I Then Shall Live.
Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here despite the weather. And please remind us through the conviction of your Holy Spirit that we are here for you. This is not about us. This is for your glory. So as we worship together today in your name, help us do it by surrendering everything to you. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Up next is song 43, or hymn 43. I can't remember the name of it. A mighty fortress is our God. Up next, we got our prayer request coming around. Sorry, Bill. Whoopsies. Up next, we have our prayer requests. If you have received one of those sheets in today's packets, I think that's what they're called. Sorry. Um, please just remember this is not just a shopping list. This is a praise report as well. So if there's anything that great has been revealed to you this week, please add it when you got the next couple seconds while the praise while the prayer box is going around. Drew, would you like to help me pass these around? While we're passing this around, will be hymn 297, Spirit of the Living God.
Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for these requests. God, I know that in this box, the needs of every heart laid out before you. Father, I know that my deepest needs are laid within this box. And Father, I ask that today, in the mighty and holy name of Jesus, the only name that's given among men whereby we must be saved, God, that today you would meet everyone's needs. Heal bodies, relationships, minds, and attitudes. Give us today, Father, your will, your spirit. Breathe upon us, Father. We just sang the song, Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on us. God, I'm asking today that there would be such a fresh and holy anointing upon us. God, not just upon the preacher of the hour, not just upon the word that is prepared, but upon our hearts, our minds, our ears, our spirits. God, that we would be awakened by you from a slumber that doesn't seem like a slumber. God, that you would raise our spirits, increase our hope, multiply our faith. God, give us a vision for tomorrow. Not just a vision for tomorrow, but a vision of hope, a vision of victory, and a vision that tomorrow is yours because it lies in your hands. No one else's. We are your children. We are your children. So bless today these requests. Bless those who are in this building today. And may the power and the presence of your holiness overshadow us today. And God, I ask this all in the powerful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. And everyone said with me, Amen. Amen. Our Salem Covenant. We covenant with the Lord and one with another and do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in all his ways according as he is pleased to reveal himself unto us in his blessed word of truth. Today, we have the privilege to receive, celebrate, enjoy, Partake of, can you think of anything else? Gather round for. Gather round for. Be together with. Holy communion. Communion is a special time. It's a time that Jesus said, remember me. But I want you to do something very special today. I want you to think about the pathos of the hour that Jesus was celebrating the Last Supper. And I want you to hear his words. Do this in remembrance of me. Good King James English. But I want you to hear the spirit of what he said. Whenever you do anything, Remember me. Remember who I am. I am. Those two little words. 
declare his divine Godship. I am that I am. Words spoken to Moses, words spoken throughout history. I am. Please take a moment. I'll give you a moment of silent prayer to do what 1 John 1 9 says confess our sin. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. Let's pray. Father, so often we come before you with, as Ben said earlier, a shopping list of our needs. God, we only have one great need, and that is to be forgiven of our sin. Lord, your word tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, Father, corporately, Forgive us of our sin. Cleanse us from unrighteousness. And as we approach the throne of grace and this table that is set before us, God, we do not presume to come upon our own goodness or righteousness. We come because we've been bidden by you. Whosoever will, come. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Come. Come to me with your needs. Come. Father, forgive us. Bless the cup. Bless the bread. Bless the hands that distribute it. Bless the hands that pass it. May we today Know beyond a shadow of a doubt to whom we belong. Now we belong to Jesus. This we pray in that precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. So within our hands we have the bread, uh, the body of Jesus broken for us. Uh, it's sometimes called the, the great exchange what Christ did for us, that he takes our punishment and we get his, his blessing, his, his reward that he deserved for 
living a perfect life. So with that, help us to remember that what was our punishment is his punishment, and what his reward is our reward, so he may partake. And with the people with the juice, distribute the juice. So with the cup, we have the juice. The same color as the, the blood that ran down the cross that was shed for us. So in taking that, help us to, to just think on the fact that through this, this red crimson liquid we have here, that through the, the red crimson liquid that came out of that, that Savior many, 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 many years ago, makes us the same color as the snow that is out there on the ground, which like snow. Like snow. It's, fine. Yeah, it's fine. So with that, our sin is, is removed, so you may partake. Thank you. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now and let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. We have any children? I know... Two of them are here. <laughs> nope. You're moving good. Running down there. <laughs> the best seat in the house, huh? <laughs> to see the... Oh, there you go. All right. Well, it's good to have a good crowd up here. Today, we're continuing 
Uh, last time we learned about the, the Holy Spirit and kind of the, the church fanning out, now we have somebody who's going to come up against the church and, and doesn't like it at first. So we're going to learn about the person of Saul who became Paul. So it says, starts off, Peter and the other apostles went into the cities near Jerusalem to preach. More and more people were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. They were called Christians. But many people thought it was wrong to be a Christian. One of them was a man named Saul. He was an official in the temple. Get right there in the red. He does not look too happy. Doesn't he look too happy? He looks really happy. Ben? Yes. Jan. Okay. Is he embarrassed or what? I don't know if he's embarrassed. He's kind of steaming. So... Saul didn't want anyone, anywhere, to worship Jesus. He was always going into the houses of Christians and taking them off to jail. Look at that. He's, he's going in people's houses and, and locking them up in jail. Saul heard that Jesus' uh, apostles were preaching in the city of Damascus. He had a high priest in the temple write letters to the officials in Damascus. The letters gave Saul the power to arrest and to take, uh, take to Jerusalem any man or woman in Damascus who believed in Jesus. Then Saul could bring these people to Jerusalem for trial. There he goes. He's walking to arrest more of them. You see him on the path? Well, he's going to go. He's going to go get more Christians. But look what happens. Saul and some other men were on the road to Damascus. They had almost reached the city. Suddenly, a bright light from heaven flashed all around Saul. The light was so bright, Saul had to close his eyes. He fell to the ground. Do you think that's just regular sun? No? There you go. A voice said, a voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you so cruel to me? Who are you? Saul asked. I am Jesus. I'm the one whom you are so cruel. Now get up and go into the city. There you will be told what to do. So he's listening. Kind of knocked him right off his, his feet. Saul stood up and opened his eyes. He could not see a thing. Look at that, he's walking with a stick. Someone had to take Saul by the hand and lead him to Damascus. For three days, Saul was blind. Imagine how many bumps on his shins he had by running into stuff. Then a man came to a house. Here we are, we're at Damascus now. A man came to the house where Saul was staying. The man's name was Ananias. He was a follower of Jesus. Ananias put his hands on Saul and said, The Lord Jesus has sent me. He wants you to be able to see and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, that's what's going to happen. As soon as Ananias stopped speaking, something that looked like fish scales fell from Saul's eyes. He could see again. The Holy Spirit filled him. Look at that. Crusty stuff. Kind of looks like sleep when you wake up. At least in the picture. Saul stayed with Jesus' followers in Damascus and was baptized. Soon he began to tell everyone that Jesus was the Lord's, uh, Jesus was the Lord's way. He became an apostle. After a while, he was called Paul. So, at the start, he was a really, really mean guy who wanted to round up all the Christians. And it's kind of funny that that God chose him to be one of his big-time preachers who brought the message to all the Gentile world, which is good news for us, right? Yeah. So you can go back to your seat and just remember that God can use anybody. And no matter how much bad you've done, it's forgivable by the cross. You get blinded what? Don't freak out, yeah. Maybe go to the emergency room. All right, you can go. Would the ushers come forward, please?
Shall we stand? Heavenly Father, by the power of the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you to bless these offerings, these tithes, these gifts of great purport. Father, we thank you that our tithes and offerings are more than dollars. God, we give unto you ourselves unreservedly. Father, your word says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. So today, Father, we thank you for these gifts. We ask, God, that you would make us wise stewards, but God, above all, that you would use us as we offer ourselves to you in hope. For we pray in Christ's name, everyone said, amen. 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 Please be seated. <laughs> To God be the glory. Great things he has done. I don't know about you, but we had a great week this week. Going to the emergency room, spending four hours there. Awesome. Got to witness to people. God, would you just tell us where to go from now on, please? It would be a lot easier. Stella came in the office this morning and she said to me, don't you dare stop preaching the way you've been preaching. I don't know where you are. I don't know where your heads are. I don't know what you believe completely. We've made the devil mad. And when you make the devil mad, he pulls out all the stops to try to stop you from doing what you're called to do. With the last ounce of my strength, I will declare the word of God. I do not care. I do not care what trials he tries to bring against us. That not only puts Stella and I and our family at risk, but that puts you at risk. I don't know whether you know that or not. But it does. But I want to share. Uh, if you have your bulletin, look at, at the title of the message. The powerless church has little for the devil to counterfeit. In preparing this message, I thought in my mind I was going to go get some uh, Monopoly money and bring it here and just take it, throw it out, and let you all have as much of it as you wanted. In doing research, I found out that in banks, anybody here been a, a teller at a bank? Have you? Cool. Do you know for... People who handle real money, being able to identify counterfeit money is not a problem. 
I, I, get, I get tickled when you go to, the, to one of the stores and you hand them a $20 bill and they do it up to the side and they do this and they do that. You hand that same $20 bill to somebody in the bank, they do, go like this and put it in the drawer. You know why? Because they know what it feels like. They know what it is. They know the real thing. And the devil doesn't have to counterfeit what's already counterfeit. I want to read to you a scripture. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24 says this. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. You know who the very elect are? Raise your hand. You're the very elect. The good news of miracles and transformed lives does not bring excitement in many places today. You know why? Because you'll get a, a totally overwhelming amount of warnings. Oh, be careful. Be careful. Don't worry. You, that, that might be, it might be a, a false thing. God has been absent too long from the life of the church today. When something powerful happens, we look at it with suspect. Any of us who see miracles and declare the good news to others often receive piles and piles of warnings. Oh, be careful. They can counterfeit miracles. I can... I can guarantee you that the devil counterfeits miracles. Go with me back to Egypt when Moses went to Pharaoh and he threw his staff down and it became a serpent. What did the magicians do? They threw theirs down and they became serpents too. You say, wait a minute, you're talking about that weird stuff. Well, let me tell you, if it's here, it ain't weird. It is a legitimate concern to be worried about false miracles, false signs and wonders. There was a time in the church when people preached nothing about uh, the salvation, but it was all about signs and wonders. What miracles took place in your church today? What signs and wonders were happening in your church today? Oh, well, isn't that wonderful? We saw a leg lengthen. We saw uh, cancer heal. We saw blind people see. We, all the wonderful miracles, yes. And don't you think those things happen in the darkness of, of Africa, in the darkness of places where Jesus hasn't been preached? They certainly do. But there must be something real in order to make a counterfeit of it. And the power. Every, every Sunday morning when I step up here to preach, I say to myself, just deliver the message. Don't get involved. Don't get excited. Don't... Don't do the things, but I can't help that. I can't. Mark chapter 13, verse 22 says this. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders. The same thing that Matthew said. Signs and wonders. I had a gentleman who was a, on the search committee, as a matter of fact, when they called me to this church. And he said, Bill, we can build a great church if we just have a healing ministry. We can build a great church if we do miracles every Sunday. Well, I want to tell you what, folks. Don't get too shook up at this, but you can't do miracles. I can't do miracles. The only miracle worker is God. You might be the conduit that brings the miracle. You might be the one who God happens to use to do the miracle. Don't you think if I had the ability to do miracles that they would be running out of this building like water? Yes, they would. I'd be laying hands on every one of you that has sickness. I'd be laying hands on every one of you that needs money. I'd be praying for your business. I'd be praying for your finances. And God would be doing them incredibly 
above anything we can imagine. But I am not able to do that. All I can do is deliver the message of God. And the message of God says is, there are miracles, signs, and wonders to be received by the church, but we have to be in a position to receive them. Much of the church lives with little or no power today. Did you know that? We go every Sunday. We sit in a pew. We hear the message. We go, wow, that was good, or wow, that was terrible, or wow, that was boring, or whatever. I don't know what your emotions might be every Sunday. Believers sit comfortably in the notion that they're okay because they don't face spiritual conflict. If you face spiritual conflict, you're on the right path. I'll say that again. If you are facing spiritual conflict, you, my friend, are on the right path. Let me ask you a question. Is it true that a car parked on the side of the street, legally parked, that car cannot break a law sitting there, right? If it's legally parked. Well, what was that car designed to do? To sit there and take up space? Was that car designed to look pretty? To have a glittering shine on it? Was that car designed to be something that sat there for 10 years and never moved? Well, it's designed to go places and accomplish things, isn't it? What do you think you were designed for? To sit here and look pretty. Well, no, I was talking to Kelly, not you, Ben. <laughs> Each one of us was designed to make an impact in this world. <laughs> what impact can I make? There was a lady named, what was Mrs. Rook's first name? I don't know. Martha Rooks. A little old lady taught Sunday school in a little old church in little old Stone Lick, Ohio that had 15, 20 members. And she looked at me one day and she said, I'm going to pray for you. If you want to blame anybody, blame her. <laughs> How would you like to have been the little Sunday school teacher in a little church in North Carolina that gave the message to Billy Graham that touched his life? You probably felt like you weren't, use, weren't worth anything because you only led one little old person to the Lord, one guy named William Graham. My friend, let me tell you something. The millions of people that his life has touched because of one life that touched his. You're designed like the car for a purpose. You see, the fear of making mistakes is not doing a particular ministry maybe or not doing something that God's called you to do. Many believers fall into that tragedy. They fail to see that perfectionism is religion, form without power. Excellence is kingdom living. Saying yes to the king is the first step in discipleship. Saying yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. Not yes, pastor, I'll follow you. As Jesus, I'll follow you. Being driven by love makes possible not 
to remain stationary. Stella's car can be driven without a key. You get in it, push the button, and it starts. Oh, wait a minute. You got to have that little thing with you called a fob. And you get in without it and you push that button all day long and nothing's going to happen. But if you get in with the power to ignite that little button and you push it, whoa, it starts. We are made just exactly like that. We have this little button inside of us. And it's got to be ignited by the power of God first. And then God pushes the button and we're ready to go. But many are afraid to go because we certainly don't want to make a mistake. My friends, if you could pile up all of my mistakes in one place, it would fill up the state of Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. You ever heard of a baseball player named Babe Ruth? At one time, he held the record for most home runs, correct? Do you know what record he still holds? Most strikeouts. Do you know if you ain't swinging, you ain't hitting? Do you know if you ain't coming up to the plate and willing to take a swing at that pitch, you're not going to hit a ball. 1962, I was called to go to a hitting clinic in Crosley Field in Cincinnati. I was a pretty good baseball player at the time, hitting a lot of home runs. So Ted Klazuski, who became at one time a White Sox player, played for the Reds at the time. He said, you got one of the best swings I've seen in a long time for a kid. And I said, good. So they put me up to the plate. And an old left-hander was pitching. His name was Joe Nuxall. And he threw a pitch at me, and I took him out of Crosley Field. I ran around the bases like this. <laughs> got to home plate, stepped on it. I went, hmm. So a couple other kids got to hit, and it's my turn to hit again. As I'm stepping in the batter's box, Smokey Burgess was catching, or was it Johnny Edwards? One of the two. And as I put one foot in, he said, duck, and I said, huh? He said, duck, and I turned around, and there was a baseball right there. <laughs> I dropped to the ground. And that was before real batting helmets. Those were them little things you wore over your ears. And I, my heart was just going, boom, boom. So I looked out there, and there's Joe Nuxall standing again. He wasn't smiling this time. He reared back and let another one fly, and I stepped back like this and went. I never touched another ball that he threw. You know why? Because I was afraid. And you know what fear does to you? Fear paralyzes you. You know the biggest lie that the devil can tell you is a lie of fear. And he can tell you to be afraid. He can tell you, if you sit still, do nothing, you'll be okay. Many people come to church, sit in a pew, think that's good enough, and that'll get them where they want to go. It may get you to heaven if you've accepted Christ someplace along the line. But my friends, the thousands of people that you're to touch to help bring to heaven may never see it because you decided to sit still. Form without power. One of the greatest honors that there is that I've ever experienced is to be able to stand before people like yourself and present the word of God. The Bible says, for I am not ashamed 
of the gospel of Christ, for it is a power unto salvation. You see, love, purity, and power, that's how things get done in the kingdom of God. Love, love of God, purity of our love for God, and the power. The power to change a generation. I read a quote, I posted it this morning. It said this, that our ceiling, our ceiling is the floor of their generation. What we build to the top is where this generation starts. How willing are you to build a good foundation? How willing are you to put the columns in that need to be there? How willing are you to put the roof on so that the next generation can build on top of that? Or are you willing to do nothing? Many thinks that a false prophet is uncovered when his prophetic utterance is proven faulty. That's not true. If you read, there's a man named Abagus. He was a prophet in Paul's time. And he said some things that didn't quite pan out the way. But he was still a prophet of God. Believers are given the assignment to judge the word and not the prophet. The word of the prophet needs to be judged, not the prophet. Hmm. The false prophet and the false miracle worker are easy to spot. Just like a counterfeit $10 bill to a banker. If you're amongst people that are understanding of miracles and power. You see, they walk. The false prophet and the false miracle workers are easy to spot amongst the real because the supernatural realm, they walk in direct, they, they walk in, in the way that it brings attention to them, not attention to the word. They live to build their own kingdoms, have their own followers, and entice people to live for them. 1 John 4, 1 says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. What have they gone out to do? To build their own kingdom. Not to dupe you, not to make you look stupid, but to build our own kingdom. I want you to listen to this prayer. Heavenly Father, help me to represent Jesus well today. I commit myself to his standard of love, purity, and power. Let these realities be increasingly evident in, through, my life, all for the glory of God. Simple little prayer. A prayer that I would give to you today. Listen to this declaration. I declare that I was born for this purpose and that it has already been decided that I should carry Jesus presence and purpose to the world around me. That's not just me as a preacher. That's you as John and Bob and, and Ben. Every one of your names put in there. 
I declare that I was born for this purpose and that it has already been decided that I should carry Jesus' presence and power and purpose to the world around me. I will demonstrate his love daily and give him thanks in advance for what is about to take place. I do all this for the glory of God. If you want those, that declaration and that prayer, I will give them to you after the service for I have them printed out. Pray with me, please. Father, I would that this church would catch on fire. Catch on fire of the Holy Spirit. That God, everything that we would do and say would want to be counterfeited by the devil. But God, the real thing is the power and the purity and the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. God, I ask you today to challenge us to be all that we should be. Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is number 609, no, 98, something like that. What? Not, well, stand and sing with me the closing hymn, will you? Father, pour into us today your presence, your power, and above all, Father, purity of our hearts. Heavenly Father, may we be an example to the world, for the kingdom, to your glory. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. For we pray in Christ's name, and everyone said,